to let their lives be just a little bit harder today so they will know how to face hardship tomorrow. I take a deep breath, cross my fingers, and tell her the truth. Intrinsic motivation, the holy grail of parenting. Here's what I told her. The less we push our kids toward educational success, the more they will learn. The less we use external or extrinsic rewards on our children, the more they will engage in their education for the sake and love of learning. All kids begin life motivated by their own desire to explore, create, and build. When babies take their first step, it is because they are driven to discover and master their environment. If there's any trick to parenting, it's to keep our children from losing that internal drive. Unfortunately, parents and teachers rely on the same sort of reward system used to train monkeys and seals. It works great at the circus, but bananas and herring, or iPads and pizza, do not work for humans. Rewards may get results in the short term, but when it comes to encouraging long term drive and enthusiasm for learning, rewards are terrible motivators. When I read about the research on rewards, first in Daniel Pink's Drive and later in the original research of psychologists Harry Harlow and Edward Deasy, I was thrown. Nearly everything I do in my classroom and in my home revolves around external rewards. But Harlow's research into what motivates monkeys had me doubting my practices. In 1949, Harlow became curious about what motivates primates, and by extension, humans. So he gave eight monkeys, each in its own cage, a latch attached to a piece of wood and waited to see what they would do with it. He didn't have to wait long. The monkeys loved playing with the latches and fiddled with them over and over again until they opened up. The monkeys were opening the locks just for the fun of the activity, or, in Harlow's words, The performance of the task provided intrinsic reward. That's all the monkeys needed to spur them on. Once Harlow realized the power of intrinsic motivation, he was curious about whether an extrinsic reward, such as a raisin, would improve their performance. In the second phase of his experiment, Harlow gave half of the monkeys a raisin as a reward for opening the locks. The monkeys were quite good at opening the locks, so surely, given a reward, they would open them even faster, right? Nope. The monkeys who received raisins actually opened the locks more slowly and with less frequency than they did when no reward was offered. Something about the extrinsic reward interfered with their intrinsic motivation and threw them off their game, or latch in this case. The human analogy is simple. When a kid is fascinated by a task, he will be much more likely to persevere. Even when he falters, even when the task gets more challenging, and yes, even when he fails to master the task the first time around. Think back to the explorations of your newly mobile baby, crawling around the living room floor, pulling the cat's tail, and clearing the books off the bottom shelf of the bookcase. My sons drove me crazy dropping spoons down into the heating vent in the living room and repeatedly attempting to climb the stairs on their own. That same drive that allows kids to learn the name of every god in the Greco Roman pantheon, or the scientific name and genus of every dinosaur that lived during the Cretaceous period, fuels their learning early on in school. As kids get older, our goal should be to preserve this natural curiosity and thirst for discovery at all costs. Unfortunately, the methods we use to motivate our children, such as rewards, Are in direct conflict with what keeps kids engaged and interested. Put simply, if you'd like your child to stop doing his schoolwork, pay him for good grades. Once, many years ago, I had a student who was, according to her father, a bad speller. No matter what the student did, she failed her weekly list of 10 spelling words. Her grades hovered around a B, but that pesky spelling grade kept pulling her down into B minus territory. Her year end grade was, in fact, a B minus, and her parents were livid. Not with her, but with me. They demanded an immediate parent teacher meeting and asked some key school administrators to attend as well. They made it very clear in the meeting that their daughter wasn't a B minus student. The mother explained that despite all the support their daughter was being given, she was intrinsically a bad speller and shouldn't be penalized for that. The meeting took about an hour and a half, 
and for much of that time, I was berated by the parents for being an ineffectual teacher and warned that my actions had lowered their daughter's self-esteem to the point that she cried every Thursday night before her Friday spelling quiz. I used all of my best parent-teacher skills. I listened, kept my body language relaxed, and empathized with their frustration. I also made them a promise. I promised them that if they would allow the B-minus to stand and encourage their daughter's effort rather than her grades, they might find that this B-minus crisis would be one of the best things that ever happened to her. They were not exactly mollified. They left that meeting extremely angry that I would not change her grade, and I left feeling frustrated and wary of the fact that I would be teaching their daughter again the following year. I hope that some of what I offered up as advice might sink in, and that one day we could all laugh over this B-. That next fall, their daughter returned to school with renewed vigor and a commitment to her education. Whatever had gone down at their house over the summer, something was working. She studied hard for her spelling quizzes and hit the ground running with a 10 out of 10 on her first quiz. The perfect quiz grades continued, and about a month into the year, I graded her quiz and congratulated her on a perfect score while I was proctoring a study hall. I motioned to the recycling bin and raised my eyebrows in a silent, would you like the quiz back or should I recycle it? She walked up to my desk to retrieve the quiz and told me, I have to have the quiz or I won't get my $10. Ah, she had been getting paid a cool 10 bucks for each perfect score. I was mildly irked, but then again, what's the harm? Her parents had the money to spend on the weekly 10-point quizzes, she had some spending money in her pocket, and her past as a bad speller seemed to have faded into an unpleasant memory. Besides, she was happy. The arrangement seemed to benefit everyone, and it even worked. For a while... Sometime after the holidays, her spelling grades fell again. I asked, and yes, her parents were still offering $10 for every perfect score. It was a busy year for her, she said, but she would bring her scores back up where they were before, she promised. Except those scores never did come back up, and she ended the year, spelling-wise, about where she'd been the year before. So what went wrong? If the $10 were incentive enough for that first month or two, why did the reward stop working? There are a couple of issues at play here. First, rewards don't work because humans perceive them as attempts to control behavior, which undermines intrinsic motivation. Second, human beings are more likely to stick with tasks that arise out of their own free will and personal choice. Given the choice between sticking with a I-have-to task or doing something else, most people would choose anything that is the product of their autonomy and self-determination. Psychologist Edward Deasy, author of Why We Do What We Do, Understanding Self-Motivation, provided the human extension to Harry Harlow's work on intrinsic motivation in monkeys. Deasy sought to find out why younger children are so clearly fueled by curiosity and a desire to understand their world, and why that internal drive is often lost in older children. I had the fleeting and surely blasphemous thought that maybe all the rewards, rules, and regimentation that were so widely used to motivate school children were themselves the villains, promoting not an excited state of learning, but a sad state of apathy. To expose these villains and prove his theory, DC needed an inherently interesting task and some subjects. He discovered the Parker Brothers game Soma, the world's finest cube puzzle game, and was immediately hooked on the challenge and feeling of accomplishment he discovered when he solved the puzzles. According to DC, the Soma challenges were quite addictive, and he found himself solving puzzles in his head even after he'd put them down. He then invited student test subjects into his lab to solve the puzzles. Some of the students received a dollar for every puzzle solved, and some received nothing and had to rely on their own feelings of satisfaction. After the subjects had solved a few puzzles, DC would leave the room for eight minutes to complete an administrative task, and the subjects were left alone in the lab with the puzzles and an array of magazines. During those eight minutes, the subjects were secretly watched by the experimenter to see how they spent their free time. The students who were being paid to complete the puzzles were much less likely to play with the puzzles when there was no monetary reward on the line, while the subjects who were not being paid continued to play 
just for their personal enjoyment of the activity. In DC's view, money does not motivate so much as it controls, and that control disrupts our sense of intrinsic motivation. After a few more studies in this vein, he concluded that just about anything humans perceive as controlling is detrimental to long-term motivation, and therefore learning. Want to hover over your kids to make sure they dot their I's and cross the T's on their homework? Detrimental. Feel the need to impose some of your goals on their learning? Detrimental. Itching to impose a deadline for your son's rough draft on that science project? Detrimental. Don't believe me? Try this simple exercise. Go into a young child's room and ask to play Legos with her. If you play according to her script, everything will go fine. However, if you start to impose your goals on the project or attempt to force new directions based on your needs or wants, the fun will end, and quickly. Your child will either lose interest or get angry, but either way, your child is done with that project. The quickest way to kill off your child's interest in a game, topic, or experiment is to impose your will on her learning. So what is a parent to do if we can't bribe, supervise, or impose goals or deadlines? Believe it or not, the answer, no matter how counterintuitive it might feel, is to back off. Allow kids to have the control and autonomy they crave, even if it means struggling with the task or situation at hand. In an experiment that built on his initial results in the SOMA puzzle research trial, DC offered half of his test subjects a choice of puzzles, and predictably, the half who were given a choice spent more time playing with the puzzles and reported having more fun than the subjects not given any choice. As soon as your child is capable of working on his own, and maybe even a little bit before he is completely independent, give him choices. This is a well-known and wonderful strategy for toddlers, who are stuck in a developmental stage in which they have very little control over their world, and yet their need for autonomy is high. Offering limited choices to toddlers, do you want to wear the blue sneakers or the red sneakers? gives the impression of control without allowing so much control that anarchy and chaos result. Give school-age children control and autonomy over where, when, and how they complete their schoolwork, and let them make choices about the other important aspects of their lives, such as friends, chores, and sports, subjects we'll address in later chapters. Establish non-negotiable expectations, such as homework will be completed thoroughly and on time, or Curfew is at 10, and I expect you to be here or call if something comes up. After those expectations are made clear, older children should be allowed the autonomy to figure out the precise manner and strategy they will use in order to fulfill these expectations. As long as your expectation is that the homework will be completed thoroughly and on time, where, when, and how they complete their homework should be up to them. Don't worry. This does not mean teachers and parents have no say in our children's learning. It just means that we have to abandon our current strategy and get creative. Putting this knowledge into practice in my classroom was a challenge. I'm not going to lie. I love standing at the front of a classroom dictating the whens, wheres, and hows to my students, assigning my carefully thought-out lessons, grading that work when students hand it in on the due date. I had been teaching this way for 10 years, but given DC's research, I was moved to shake my teaching up a little bit and see what happened. Luckily, teachers all over the country are moving toward project-based learning, in which students create real-world problems or questions and then figure out how to find answers themselves. Students define the scope, goals, and steps in the project, and therefore feel a real sense of ownership over the learning. My first attempts at handing the educational reins over to my students were encouraging, and I used DC's work as a blueprint for my lessons. The more I pulled back and allowed my students to come up with the details of their own projects, assessments, and learning, the more invested they became in those projects. I had to upend my thinking in the classroom. But as I saw my students engage more enthusiastically in their learning at school, I realized I had to try these new strategies out at home with my own kids. I took the guidelines I'd gleaned from DC, set aside time alone to talk with my husband, and laid it all out for him. If intrinsic motivation happens when kids feel autonomous, 
competent, and connected to the people and world around them, then those three needs must inform our parenting. Autonomy, in which kids find out that self reliance feels great. Autonomy and independence are similar beasts, but their roots reveal a key difference. Independence is the linguistic opposite of dependence, but autonomy is something more. It comes from the Greek auto, which means self, and nomos, which means custom or law. So to be autonomous, a child has to have internalized a system of rules for living independently. In order to help foster the formation of this self rule, parents have to help kids come up with a system of guiding principles so they will be able to problem solve and think creatively while remaining rooted in tried and true principles of behavior. When parents are over controlling, kids tend not to think about why and how they act in the world. Their choice is to respond to our rules or not. When they are given more control over their worlds out of our sphere of influence, they are more likely to make solid, rule based decisions. It's a win win situation for parents, really, because autonomy begets autonomy. As kids realize they have control over their worlds, they want more control over their lives and become more responsible. While the research on intrinsic motivation shows that attempting to exert control over kids undermines their sense of autonomy, this does not mean that we should not make demands of our children. Just the opposite. Children of all ages need limits and guidance from parents and teachers. Without limits, chaos ensues, and a chaotic classroom or household does not foster learning. I've spent a lot of time in other teachers' classrooms, and when those teachers have poor classroom management skills and fail to set expectations for behavior, standards, and character, their students tend to be anxious, confused, and inattentive. In classrooms where teachers establish respect for the educational process and make their expectations clear, students are able to relax and focus on learning. One way parents and teachers try to impose control over children is to offer rewards bribes, gifts, money, and yes, even praise in exchange for performance. As we saw in that example of the student who was being paid for perfect spelling scores, rewards for academic performance work only for the short term. Is your goal an A on next Friday's algebra test or your child's interest in learning math over the long term? I know. This is hard information to swallow. Reward for performance is the American way, capitalism at work, pay for play, right? As we learned back in high school science, when B.F. Skinner gave his lab rats rewards for pressing a lever, it worked. Those rats pressed that lever over and over again, and he proved that animals continue to perform a particular behavior as long as the reward is forthcoming. And there's the key problem with using rewards to fuel behaviors. Animals continue to perform a particular behavior as long as the reward is forthcoming. But, as DC notes, when was the last time you saw a seal balance a ball on his nose without a trainer standing there with a fish in the offing? No fish, no trick. Rewards work for repetitive, uncomplicated, or boring tasks, but when it comes to creativity and nuanced learning, they are lousy motivators. One of my favorite research studies on the subject sums up the effect of money on learning in its title Money enhances memory consolidation, but only for boring material. Applying pressure in the form of control is the single most damaging thing parents and teachers can do to their children's learning. Whether in the form of threats, bribes, deals, surveillance, imposed goals, evaluations, or even rewards and praise, control is the enemy of autonomy. We parents are all guilty. Full disclosure there's a chore chart on my refrigerator. And on top of that same refrigerator is my son's favorite toy, a stuffed creature named Stinky, currently being held hostage until his room is clean, and Finn is nearly apoplectic. I had a moment of weakness fueled by frustration and accidentally reached into my old bag of parenting tricks when I made the decision to take Stinky away. And once I did it, I had to follow through. Parenting is hard. And even those of us who know what works in the abstract fall victim to old habits. That said, the research of DC and others is clear. 
any strategy that undermines autonomy is probably not going to work if long-term learning is the goal. Another drawback to offering rewards as incentive is that this strategy inhibits creativity and risk-taking. When rewards are at stake, emphasis is on the end result. So what's the point of creativity? If my students know they will receive an iPod for an A, they will take the safest route to that A because they don't want to risk the iPod reward. The student who is motivated by the process of problem-solving and intellectual exploration learns for the sake of learning. And if the A comes or the iPod falls into her lap, great. This is why intermittent rewards can work, even if routine, expected rewards do not. The thrill and surprise of a reward when you least expect it can jumpstart motivation, but again, only when it's not part of a routine practice. Weaning children off a reward-for-performance system doesn't happen in a day, particularly if pay-for-play has become your default parenting strategy. Keep those trained seals in mind and expect that the behaviors you have been eliciting with rewards may well stop as soon as the rewards disappear. This will likely be frustrating to both you and your child in the short term, so it might be worth talking to your older children about why you are ending the system they have come to expect. You are the model for your child's behavior and attitude toward failure. Children need to see examples of adults admitting to their mistakes, learning how to be better parents and people, and adopting new strategies when a previous one has failed. Make sure they know that you truly believe learning springs from failure and encourage them to view failure in the same light. Anne Sobel, a lecturer in cinematography and directing at Northwestern University in Cotter, has fought back against her students' inclination to play it safe by incorporating risk-taking and failure into her grading. I tell students that if they attempt a challenging project, I will take that into consideration when I grade, even if the film falls short of their vision. In my own teaching, I make it a practice to model a constructive and adaptive reaction to failure. I admit to my mistakes, and I'm honest about the moments my teaching strategies have failed my students, and those admissions have led to some of the most productive and cooperative moments in my classroom. Children need to understand that mistakes are simply a part of my efforts to become a better teacher, and that education never really ends. Modeling is a powerful educational strategy, far more powerful than the offer of an iPod or 10 bucks. For some reason, it was easier for me to admit to my mistakes in the classroom than in my own home. In the middle of an argument with my teenager, or when I'd grabbed the reins on some household task that had spiraled out of control, I could feel my heels digging in, even when I knew I'd screwed up. I had to push my pride aside and admit to my mistakes, and show my kids that I have the courage to fail, face it, take the lessons to heart, and move on. When my husband and I stopped dangling rewards in front of our kids, we decided to try using something I had been using for ages with my advisees at school, goals. My former middle school uses an advisory system, and teachers meet weekly with students to help them set goals regarding everything from school to social issues to handwriting. I think goals work well for students because they are rewards that remain squarely under the kids' control. Sometimes, when I feel my advisees could use a sense of renewal or a clean slate, we talk about starting from scratch with new goals for a semester. For example, one of my advisees set goals to get over her shyness, and we devise plans for talking to teachers and asking other adults for help. She made huge strides that semester because it was her goal to be completed according to her parameters, and if she failed, so what? She was accountable to no one but herself for those failures. Self-imposed goals are about the safest place there is for a kid to fail. If kids make up their own goals on their own timeline according to their criteria, then failure is not a crushing defeat. Goals can be amended, changed according to circumstances, and even postponed to maybe next week. For kids who are particularly afraid and anxious about failing, goals offer a private proving ground, a safe way to take risks, fail, and try again. If we really want our kids to invest in long-term goals, those goals have to be their goals, not ours. 
A friend of mine figured this out recently when her son pleaded to stop taking piano lessons. She was finally swayed when he told her, Mom, I think playing piano is your goal, not mine. This can be hard to keep in mind, particularly when a student is having problems, but for a goal to work, the child has to own it. Teenagers may resist the practice of goal setting, particularly if you have been a controlling parent until now. I believe my older son mocked the entire idea the first couple of times I brought it up. However, once they realize that you have turned over a new leaf and want to help them achieve their goals, their trust in your motives will return. And remember, this goal setting does not have to be conducted like a business meeting. The best discussions are relaxed, calm, and casual. My favorite conversations take place in the car, on walks, and in all those moments that pop up when you least expect them. Teenagers are not always ready to listen or talk, and sometimes you simply have to be ready to meet them where they are and when their minds and spirits are willing. Be supportive of their goals. Some goals are going to seem trivial, but if they're important enough for your child to verbalize, they are important enough for your respect and support. DC calls this strategy autonomy supportive, but I call it smart parenting. Competence, confidence born out of experience. You can prop your child's confidence up with lavish praise, but you cannot create competence through praise alone. Competence requires both ability and experience, and confidence alone can lead to disaster. Recent studies have shown that while kids need to engage in free play that includes risk-taking, risky play is much more dangerous for kids who have never been allowed to engage in it than for kids who grow up knowing how to manage risk. Knowing how to manage risk through experience is real hard-earned competence, and it makes them feel great about themselves. When my neighbor's son was five, he was absolutely positive he could operate his father's power tools. As his father had not yet taught him how to use any of those tools, this belief was built on confidence rather than competence. On one visit to his house, he led me over to his father's new wood splitter, an insanely dangerous and decidedly not kid-approved piece of machinery. He looked up at me with great hope and a hand on the power key and asked me if I'd like to see him operate it. I declined his offer and alerted his mother as I knew his confidence was dangerous, grounded in nothing more than his deep love of power tools. Now that he is nearly 12, and his father has spent hours teaching him how to operate the machinery safely and effectively, he has become a competent carpenter, woodsman, and handyman. That competence stems not just from a belief that he could work those tools, but also from a place of real ability and hours of experience under his father's guidance. Children who possess competence through experience will be safer in the world because they will not launch themselves headlong into risks they are unprepared to handle. A child who believes he's ready for the deep end of the pool because you praised his incredible talent as a swimmer when he flopped through his first two freestyle strokes is in much more danger of drowning than a child who has a realistic sense of his abilities. Be honest with your children. Praise them for their resilience and the efforts they make to recover from their mistakes. Above all, keep your eye on the prize, intrinsic motivation. Protecting kids from the frustration, anxiety, and sadness they experience from failure in the short term keeps our kids from becoming resilient and from experiencing the growth mindset they deserve. Encourage competence in your child whenever possible. Watch a child master fixing his own lunch or listen to a teenager recount the moment he made a goal in soccer practice. Competence and mastery are incredible motivators. Once children get a taste of success, particularly success born of their own efforts and persistence, it becomes addictive. This is the lovely thing about competence. It's a self-fulfilling prophecy. I have seen what can happen when a child who has previously been bribed and cajoled suddenly discovers the wonder of mastery. It's as if the sun has broken through the clouds and is shining directly on that child's face. He lights up. He wiggles with excitement. He beams. 
The best part of this moment is that once a kid masters a skill through his own self-directed efforts, he enters a positive feedback loop that keeps on giving. The buzz can last for years if it's nurtured. I've even seen this sense of competence overshadow and replace years of frustration and negative self-image. The key is that competence must come out of a child's own efforts. Keep this in perspective as you begin to withdraw rewards, false praise, gifts, unnecessary adulation, and shift to a more autonomy-supportive system. The day your child comes home from school having finally understood a complex and challenging concept, all radiant with pride and mastery, the magic of competency will become clear. Connection. Relationships are what make autonomy and competence meaningful. This last element of intrinsic motivation comes down to your child's relationship with you, with teachers, and with the world at large. Humans are social animals, and we need to know that our efforts mean something to other people and the world. The good news is that autonomy-supportive parenting tends to strengthen bonds between child and parent, while controlling practices weaken them. Again, this does not mean that parents who set strict limits are bad parents. One of the most effective mothers I've ever known is incredibly strict, but her children understand why she sets the limits she does— She reminds me a bit of Ma Ingalls, because above all else, she's reasonable and supportive of her children's autonomy and sense of competence. Consequently, her children, even her teenagers, admire and adore her and feel connected to her to a degree that is rare these days. Foster autonomy and competence and connectedness will follow. In order to foster autonomy while strengthening that connection to your kids, they need to know that you believe they can grow into your new, greater expectations. Here's where the idea of mindset comes into the picture. Stanford University psychology professor and mindset author Carol Dweck divides people into one of two mindsets, fixed or growth. A person with a fixed mindset believes that intelligence, talent, or ability are innate and remain the same throughout life no matter what he does. A person with a growth mindset, however, believes that these qualities are simply a starting point, that more is always possible through effort and personal development. Those with growth mindsets are motivated to learn for learning's own sake because they believe that by pushing and stretching themselves, they can do more and become more accomplished. They thrive on challenge and understand that failing and trying again is part of becoming smarter, better, or faster. If they discover limitations in themselves, they search for ways to overcome these challenges. The hallmark of successful individuals is that they love learning They seek challenges, they value effort, and they persist in the face of obstacles, writes Dweck. To put this research in practical terms, kids with fixed mindsets will be far less likely to persevere when school gets challenging because they don't believe they can stretch beyond their perceived limitations. Kids with growth mindsets will push on even when they fail to understand something the first time around because they know it's a matter of exerting more effort until they succeed. Sadly, overparenting undermines so much of what contributes to a growth mindset and therefore inhibits intrinsic motivation. Overparenting teaches kids that without our help, they will never be able to surmount challenges. When we save them from risk and failure, we communicate to our kids that we don't have faith in their ability to grow, improve, and surmount challenges, and we encourage a fixed mindset. The sort of dependence created by rescuing and overparenting may feel like connectedness, but because it communicates our lack of faith in them, it undermines healthy connectedness by emphasizing control rather than love and support. Just as connectedness with parents shores up kids' confidence at home, kids are much more likely to take academic and emotional risks at school if they feel connected to their teachers. As I see it, This idea of connectedness goes beyond the classroom to the larger world outside. An understanding of geometry is abstract and meaningless until it is connected to the beautiful and powerful angles of bridges, architecture, and astronomy. 
Without building a connection between Roman culture and the roots of modern languages, Latin truly is a dead language and unlikely to inspire passion or drive in my students. So one of the most important things parents can do for their children is to show them that they are not alone in the world, that they matter in the big picture, and that their parents are there to support them as they find their place within it. Desirable difficulties lead to mastery. While autonomy, competence, and communication sound like great concepts in the abstract, allowing kids to make the mistakes and face the failures that flow from increased autonomy goes against our parenting instincts. It's hard to watch, and it's even harder not to jump in when we see our kids frustrated or upset. I get frequent emails from parents whose kids were frustrated by an assignment or a quiz question that wasn't phrased precisely the same way I'd phrase the material in class. We want life to be smooth sailing for our kids, but interesting research shows that smooth sailing isn't where real, deep learning happens. Small failures, when the stakes are relatively low and the potential for emotional and cognitive growth is high, are what psychologists Elizabeth and Robert Bjork call desirable difficulties. Learning that comes with challenge is stored more effectively and more durably in the brain than learning that comes easily. Learning occurs when we observe something. We hear, see, or otherwise experience information in some way, and our brains transform that perception into a representation our brains understand. This is called encoding. We perceive hundreds of experiences all day long, and yet we don't necessarily hold on to all of those perceptions in our long-term memory. In order to turn those ephemeral perceptions into long-term memory, we must consolidate them. Consolidation is the process of organizing, sorting, and ordering perceptions and experiences into something the brain can store away and pull up later. Finally, in order to really nail that memory down, we must tag it for retrieval later on. This final part of the process, retrieval, is vital to learning because it solidifies knowledge through the process of pulling the information back out of the brain in order to apply it to novel situations and contexts. This is why rote memorization and regurgitation are ineffective teaching tools. They do not go far enough toward creating durable learning. A popular buzzword in education today is mastery, and mastery demands retrieval. Students need to be able to recall information and apply it, connect it to other disciplines, demonstrate it for someone else, or otherwise render that information useful in their world. Teachers understand that you don't really know something until you can teach it to someone else, and this is because being able to teach information requires all three parts of the learning equation, encoding, consolidation, and retrieval. But here's the catch. It turns out that the easier it is to retrieve information, the less durable the information is in your brain. So the harder you have to work to retrieve and apply knowledge in a novel way, the more durably that knowledge will be encoded. That is why aversion to failure is a handicap. As the authors of Make It Stick, The Science of Successful Learning explain, errors are an integral part of learning. If kids are terrified of making mistakes, they will shy away from taking chances to the detriment of their learning and personal growth. In my work as a teacher, I talk to parents all the time who claim that their child simply can't abide failure, that it makes kids anxious, upset, and frustrated, which in turn makes parents anxious, upset, and frustrated. They worry that even if they adopt a rosy view of failure, their child is too afraid to fail. I tell them to watch their child undertake a task they love under their own motivation and control and see just how afraid of failure that kid really is. A child who flips out over a challenging fractions equation during homework time is often the same child who will sit down to play Minecraft for three hours, gleefully overcoming repeated obstacles in order to construct the perfect lofty tower to house his stash of treasures and show off his architectural prowess. Our kids have not entirely lost their ability to face failure. They've simply misplaced it among their trophies and ribbons and award certificates. 
Children can be taught how to rediscover their willingness to fail and tap into their intrinsic motivation, even when they have become reward junkies, slaves to praise, and dependent on our interventions at every turn. It's not going to be easy, especially in the transitional stage, but I promise the ends will more than justify the challenge of the means. Chapter 3 Less Really Is More Parenting for Autonomy and Competence. When my husband and I started to transform our own parenting, we knew it would be a shock to the flawed system we'd been cultivating in our family for 15 years. Rather than leave our kids to wonder whether their parents had suddenly been taken over by aliens, we sat down one night with them and laid it all out, our parenting transgressions and our plans to reform. Yes, the teen rolled his eyes. Finn asked to be excused from the table about two minutes into the discussion. But when we admitted that we had been doing things all wrong and that we believed that changing the way we parent would make them better, more independent, confident, and competent people, I think I caught them listening. We told them that the more competent they became, the more we would let them do for themselves. The more we saw that they could handle difficult decisions, the more we would trust them to make them. There were some initial hiccups and setbacks and maybe even some pushback and tantrums, but once the kids figured out that we had no plans to go back to our old ways of dependent parenting, they stepped up. My older son, who has always been fairly independent, started to take responsibility for everything in his life I did not need to be a part of anymore. He started using the alarms on his calendar as a backup for his spotty memory. He made checklists to help him remember the things he needs to do before the start of the school day. He organized his forms for high school and gave me what he needed me to read and sign. He took control of ordering his back-to-school supplies, packed for two weeks of camp, and left notes for me on the counter when people called. My younger son, who is usually willing and eager to let me do everything for him, recall our adventures in shoelace tying, suddenly took charge of his morning tasks without being asked, and even made a checklist after forgetting his towel one day at our local pond. He cleaned his room, organized his desk, and figured out where and when he planned to complete his homework every night. Best of all, he saw that my older son could do the laundry and asked to be taught how to use the washer and dryer, too. Two weeks into our blissful honeymoon period, my younger son, Finnegan, suffered a bit of a setback in his journey toward autonomy and competence. As the door slammed closed on the last kid heading for the school bus, I noticed his math and spelling homework lying on the living room coffee table. I looked out the window at the bus stop, and there he was, oblivious to his oversight, twirling his hands in the air while explaining some detail of an imaginary world to his friend Pierce. I looked back down at the homework, and back out the window, and back to the homework. And then I did my best to get on with my day, knowing that I was scheduled to stop by the school later, and it would be so easy to deliver Finn's homework to his classroom, maybe even surreptitiously slide it into his locker or backpack. He'd done such a good job on it, too, so conscientiously completing it in his neatest handwriting, effort now wasted. I picked it up off the table, looked at the neat letters and numbers, and put it down again. Flummoxed, I turned to Facebook and posted. For those of you who think this whole letting my kids mess up is easy, know this. One of my sons left his homework assignment on the living room table, completed in a timely and neat fashion. I have to go to his school anyway to drop something off. Leaving that homework on the table, knowing it will cost him his recess today, is killing me. I've looked at it 20 times, even picked it up once, but there it is. And there it will stay, waiting for him to see when he gets home and realizes what he could have done to make sure that homework made it into his backpack and his teacher's hands. Facebook friends began responding immediately, many with their pledges of support and enthusiastic approval and lots of likes. But one friend posted her strong disapproval. Jessica, I admire you greatly, as I hope you know, but I could not do this. 
I forget things every day. I have driven things to my husband's office that he has left on the kitchen counter. I think a certain level of distraction is inevitable in our lives, no matter how hard we try. And high school kids are the most overwhelmed by it. I would be so happy that that homework was done on time, neat and ready, that unless I was unable to do so, I would take it to school. I would save my consequences for homework that was not done or was not done well. I thought about her words for the rest of the morning. I had to admit that, yes, I would go out of my way to deliver a friend's forgotten wallet or my husband's forgotten power cord, so why would I treat my children any differently? Because I'm not raising those other people. I treat my children differently because I have a greater responsibility to them than to make them happy and grateful for my love and support. In order to raise competent, capable adults, I have to love them enough to put their learning before my happiness. This shift in the way I understood my role as a parent was the hardest part of our switch to a more autonomy supportive parenting style. Harder than watching my kids mess up, harder than knowing they were going to mess up before they did and not preventing those train wrecks. I had to stop equating the act of doing things for my children, saving them from themselves, scoring a smile and a hug when I showed up at school with a dropped mitten or toy, with good parenting. It still feels good to do things for them, and I still do all the time. But the things I do for them are different now. And my motivations are based on an evaluation of their needs, not mine. Before, I was doing the things they could do for themselves to feel good about my parenting. Now, when I choose to do things for my children, I know my actions come from a place of genuine love. And I think my kids sense that too. When I push parents to give their kids autonomy, I don't mean to imply that parents should drop all parental oversight and walk away, hoping the kids will respond by stepping up to the plate with newfound autonomy and intrinsic motivation. Autonomy supportive parenting is not negligent parenting, and it is not permissive parenting. Autonomy supportive parents establish specific and clear expectations, make themselves physically and emotionally present, and offer guidance when kids get frustrated or need redirection. The best part about being an autonomy supportive parent is that all the negative stuff we do to get our children to do the things we want them to do nagging, nitpicking, hovering, directing stops. These parenting techniques are destructive to our relationships with our kids anyway, so parenting in their absence is a more peaceful and enjoyable affair all around. Autonomy supportive parenting gives kids what they need. Children are starved for responsibility and a role within the family, and all the jockeying for power and the mischief that arises when their hands are idle stems from our failure to give our kids a clear way to contribute to the family's well being. Kids thrive on our expectations and they flourish when given responsibilities of their own and the education they need to carry them out successfully. That said, a certain degree of parental involvement is crucial for children's learning and emotional well being. For example, study after study shows that a strong family school bond leads to better educational and emotional outcomes. And when teachers are polled, they point to involved parents as one of the most important elements of school success. This is still true despite headlines over flawed myopic research studies that have claimed parental involvement is overrated. Teachers love parents who show up for parent teacher conferences, who help out with class trips, and offer their support when it is needed. There is a difference, however, between being involved in your child's learning and taking over. The line between overparenting and autonomy supportive parenting can be hazy, but there is a clear difference between the kind of parenting that results in dependent, unmotivated, and unsuccessful children and the kind that produces resilient, driven, intrinsically motivated kids. In order to draw a line and to clarify why it's so important to support autonomy rather than dependence, I have to return to the research for a minute. Psychologist Wendy Grolnick has done some fascinating work on the impact that autonomy supportive versus controlling parenting has on children's motivation. In her lab, she videotaped mother child pairs for three minutes and rated mother's interactions with their child 
as controlling or autonomy supportive. When Grolnick invited these mother child pairs back to the lab for a second visit, the children were put in a room by themselves to work at a task independently, and the results were striking. Children who had previously been directed in their play by controlling mothers gave up when faced with frustration in their solitary play. Stop for a moment and realize what this means. The kids who were being raised by controlling or directive parents could not complete tasks on their own. But the kids who were being raised by autonomy supportive parents stuck with tasks, even when they got frustrated. Kids who can redirect and stay engaged in tasks, even when they find those tasks difficult, become less and less dependent on guidance in order to focus, study, organize, and otherwise run their own lives. These competent, more autonomous kids enjoy their work more. Children who rely on their parents to direct them through tasks, however, continue to require guidance and direction. And as the complexity of the task escalates with age and maturity, the complexity and nature of the parental intervention usually escalates as well. These are the kids who need their parents to help them with homework into middle school and beyond. These are the kids who can't manage their schedules and priorities as they approach adulthood. Sure, the leap from a controlling parenting style to autonomy supportive parenting is challenging, but changing any habit is a challenge at first. Keep your eye on that brass ring of the positive feedback loop. The more independent you allow your children to be, the more independent they will become. Making the switch from controlling to autonomy supportive will require some investment of time and patience. If your child never learned to pack his own lunch, do the laundry, clean out the car after school, load or unload the dishwasher, or do any of the many tasks any kid should be able to do by the time she hits middle school, there's going to be a steep learning curve. The tasks may not get done to your exact specifications the first time around. And there may be pushback as your child balks at his new responsibilities. But the rewards come, and sooner than you may expect. While our children tend to love us no matter what we do or how we parent, I would rather my children think of me as the sort of parent who guides rather than directs, supports rather than controls, the sort of parent who is more concerned with my child's competence and the strength of our connection. Than the alignment of the dishes in the dishwasher or a stray white sock tossed in with a colored load of laundry. Autonomy supportive parenting is not the same thing as permissive parenting because discipline, respect, and rules all have an important place in this approach. Children need rules and behavioral guidelines. Most of all, children need structure. Young children test the boundaries of their capabilities but find it reassuring and safe when adults provide limits on their explorations. Toddlers test limits in order to be reassured that nothing has changed and that their world, including their parents and the rules they impose, can be relied upon. They test, we reassure, they relax, and the cycle repeats ad nauseum until that toddler finally gets shipped off to Siberia or enters kindergarten. I try not to mention this in front of my middle school students, but tweens and teens present a variant on the toddler cycle of testing. They test their curfew, we reassure them that it's still 10 o'clock, and they relax. They test our resolve regarding boy girl sleepovers, we reassure them that no, we still don't allow it, and they relax. They test our standards for their behavior, we reassure them that we still expect them to be kind and respectful toward us. And they relax. And the cycle repeats ad nauseum until the teenager gets kicked out of the house or starts college. Testing limits is a way of testing independence, and that's a good thing, even if it makes us want to stick a fork in our heads. It's exhausting, yes, but it's a necessary part of creating independent kids. One way to make this testing easier is to establish clear expectations for their behavior. And more important, stick to those expectations and employ consequences when those expectations are not met. This limit setting is a key element of autonomy supportive parenting. Limits are structure. Limits give kids reassuring information about what to expect and how to act according to those expectations. Limits make kids feel safe and cared for.
Parents who establish high standards and subsequently enforce those high standards are not necessarily controlling. In fact, there is plenty of evidence to show that children react favorably to parents who hold children accountable for lapses in behavior or failure to uphold expectations. However, when parents resort to controlling behavior in their attempts to hold children to standards, when they offer bribes, rewards, excessive monitoring, or pressure, this corrodes a child's sense of autonomy and therefore his intrinsic motivation, and, as we have established, his success in school and life. Creating new habits. Once I'd weaned myself off my need to save my kids, I had to help them learn how to be in charge of their own lives. We taught them how to use the appliances and complete all sorts of household tasks, but we also had to teach them how to form new habits, how to remember all those responsibilities and make them a part of their daily life. In The Power of Habit, Charles Duhigg explains that habits come out of a basic feedback loop, a cue, the routine, and the reward. As an example, he writes about his habit of eating a cookie every afternoon around three. The cue, hunger or boredom, triggers a habit, going to the cafeteria, and the reward for the routine is both the satisfied hunger and the relief from boredom. In order to create new habits, you have to create a new cue, establish a routine tied to that cue, and find an appropriate reward for the routine to close the feedback loop. As we've seen, rewards may be antithetical to creating long-term success, but they can be powerful motivators when it comes to mundane, repetitive tasks. We held a family meeting to decide on our cues. I asked my sons to think about what they do when they get home from school. My younger son said that he likes to do his homework immediately after school so he does not have to think about it and can play with his Legos or draw in peace. We agreed that his cue would be his after-school snack. He'd come home, prepare his own snack, emphasis his, and start his homework. He agreed to check in with me when it was done, and his reward would be the feeling of satisfaction he gets from finishing his homework thoroughly and with his best effort. The reward, of course, was time to play with his Legos. Find out what works best for your child and make that the routine. The most important habits we all vowed to adopt have to do with technology. We all agreed that part of our routine for homework includes shutting down phones, iPods, and other devices that distract us from our work. We all agreed that the cue none of us can resist is the sound of an email or text arriving in our inbox. If we omit those cues, we won't even be tempted to engage in the routine of checking email and can enjoy the reward of homework completed without distractions. In our home, checklists have become a favorite cue, and I was surprised to find that praise for mastery and effort can be a powerful motivator. I assumed we'd have to come up with elaborate reward ideas, but in the end, increased independence is the reward my children have been craving all along. Change is never easy, particularly in the first days. It definitely does not feel good, and there were moments along the way when I was feeling like a really mean and terrible mother. Given some time and persistence, however, change happens, and it doesn't just feel good, it feels great. Your kids will still make a stink here and there when they don't want to do something that needs to be done, but that's realistic. They're children. Even Laura Ingalls protested having to do her chores once in a while. But once your kids have detoxed off rewards and the overparenting withdrawal symptoms have subsided, your kids might just do for themselves because they can and because they want to, because it feels good to be of use, first in our family and later in the big wide world. Because I spent months fumbling about in the hazy gray area between controlling and autonomy supportive parenting, I came up with some guidelines to clarify the difference. Controlling parents give lots of unsolicited advice and direction. That's not the right way to load the dishwasher. Always wash the plates before putting them in and stack all the large plates on the left side. Don't leave the dishes in the sink and come back later. Do it this way. Do it now. Do it later. We all have our own way of doing household chores, so there's every possibility that your child may not load the dishwasher precisely as you'd like it done. 
Unsolicited advice and direction, commonly known as helping from the parent's perspective or nagging from the child's, interferes with her sense of autonomy, conveys a lack of faith in her competence, and because it's irritating and upsetting to both of you, undermines your connection. When the child who loaded those food-laden plates into the dishwasher unloads the dishwasher, she will discover that crusty food on the plate, and you will have the opportunity then to explain how to prevent that mistake in the future. Offer guidance when the child is stuck and seize the big learning moments, but otherwise, hold your tongue. The mistakes she makes and corrects on her own are learning moments. The mistakes you anticipate don't benefit anyone, save for you in that brief moment when it makes you feel better that the plates are stacked north-south instead of east-west. Controlling parents take over. I'll just do it. You go play. We have to get to school. I'll do it myself when I get home. No, not that way. Just let me do it. Sometimes it's just easier to take over, particularly if you are under a time crunch or exhausted. Remember, the goal is for children to learn how to do it for themselves, not for the task to get done. Sometimes it's going to be more important to be a minute late particularly when a child masters something he's been struggling with. Step back, breathe, and remember what's really important in the big picture. Controlling parents offer extrinsic motivators in exchange for behaviors. You get one jelly bean for every toy you clean up. If you walk the dog every morning, I'll buy you new sneakers. If you load and unload the dishwasher for an entire week without being asked, I will get you that video game you've been asking for. As long as you keep rewards to a minimum and space them out, it's fine to celebrate or acknowledge in some way a child's accomplishment on the way to a more autonomous self. But many basic household responsibilities, such as walking the dog or taking out the garbage, should be viewed as part of family maintenance not as endeavors deserving of hoopla or a grand reward. Everyone should contribute to what needs to be done around the house, and rewarding these kinds of basic activities suggests that doing them is heroic as opposed to expected. Controlling parents provide solutions or the correct answer before the child has had a chance to really struggle with a problem. But honey, you know five times four is 20. You just did that down here. I'll just look that word up for you while you do the spelling list. Just give me that pencil and I'll show you. Not like that, like this. Not all answers come immediately. Give children time and silence to think. Not only will it teach them to value quiet, it also shows them that you value the process of coming up with the answer as much as the answer itself. Controlling parents don't let children make their own decisions. Do your math first and then your spelling. Do your homework here at the table where I can see you. You should play tennis rather than baseball this season. Sometimes it's better to allow your child to experience the ownership and rush of independence that comes from choosing one sport over another or one game over another, and that ownership is often more important than the activity. Decision-making is a complex process that takes a lot of practice, so give your child that opportunity to try on her autonomy for size. Autonomy-supportive parents guide children toward solutions. I know you know what 5 times 3 is, so what happens when you add another 5? Why do you think the cold glass broke when you poured hot water into it? Try holding the protractor so you can read the numbers right side up. Parenting is teaching, and teachers look for the teachable moments in just about everything we do. Find those moments and lead your child toward answers. Discoveries children make under their own steam will always be remembered longer and understood more deeply than the answers you hand them out of impatience. Autonomy-supportive parents allow for mistakes and help children understand the consequences of those mistakes. It's no big deal you dropped that glass. I'll show you how to clean it all up, and you can remember to carry fewer next time. Pick out the lumps in the oatmeal, and I'll show you how to avoid that mistake for next time. 
The mop bucket spilled because it's too short to hold the weight of the mop handle. Just clean up the mess and use the other bucket next time. Autonomy supportive parents value the mistakes as much as the successes. I'm so proud of you for sticking with that worksheet even though it was hard for you. What could you have said to your brother that might have helped him understand you rather than throw his toy at you? One way to teach our children that we value mistakes as an educational tool is to support them and love them as much during the mistakes as we do during the successes. Find the lessons in the failures. Help them discover new ways to cope and rebound from their mistakes in order to do better next time. Empathize and love them when they have messed up, because that's when they need our support the most. Autonomy supportive parents acknowledge children's feelings of frustration and disappointment. I get mad too when I can't do something right the first time, but I keep trying until I figure it out. Remember yesterday when I did not get that job I wanted? That was really disappointing, but I know I'll figure something else out if I work at it. I can imagine how frustrating this math must be for you, but won't it feel great when you know how to do it? Let your child know that you understand that algebra is hard sometimes, and it must have felt terrible when Kayla refused to sit with her at lunch, and that yes, it can be really frustrating when the teacher marked up that paper she worked so hard on. We all need to feel heard and understood, and this is when connection happens. Show your child that you empathize with her feelings, and subsequent problem solving will be much easier to hear. Autonomy supportive parents give feedback. Look down at your buttons. Something looks off. Can you figure out what's wrong? If you forgot to carry the two in that other problem, maybe you made the same mistake on this problem. Effective feedback supports effort and guides the child towards seeing her mistakes. Kids value supportive observations that encourage them to solve their own problems more than specific directions because the solutions are their own, not yours. As you make your way through the gray areas and begin to discern black from white, try to remember that the line between controlling and autonomy supportive parenting is not always going to be easy to see. Sometimes it's going to be downright blurry, and some controlling behaviors, such as rewards and praise, can easily be mistaken for positive parenting. You will make mistakes. We all do. But as long as we love our children and make it clear to them that our love is not contingent on their performance, they will be fine. Research has shown that the worst kind of controlling parenting is the type that either withholds affection or makes it contingent on performance. This type of parenting hits kids where they're most vulnerable, their basic sense of safety and fear of abandonment. Even subtle withdrawal has a deleterious effect on children's sense of security. So be careful about how you interact with your children when you know you are disappointed in their performance. As long as we steer clear of this type of parenting, we can make a lot of other mistakes along the way. Abandoning rewards and other forms of controlling parenting may seem counterintuitive at first. But as parents get tired of parenting dependent children and the positive effects of autonomy supportive parenting catch on at home and in the classroom, all of this will begin to feel a lot less revolutionary and a lot more like common sense. As for my own dilemma over that forgotten homework, I fretted and puzzled over my decision. Why not just be a nice mom and give him a break this one time? When it came time to head over to the school, and that homework whispered to me one last time, I realized why I could not. Why bailing my children out and saving them from the consequences of their failures is different from doing my friends or husband a favor here and there. I went back inside the house to post my Eureka moment to the Facebook thread. As my discussions with Finn over the last couple of weeks have been about packing away homework the night before, so it does not get lost in the rush of morning, this is a perfect way to drive that point home. And Finn does know I have his back. I make sure he knows that every day, in every way. And yes, I forget and lose things too. My keys, like 10 times a day. But those mistakes cause me to come up with strategies to help remember the next time. 
This homework is a specific response to a specific deficit in his planning and will pay huge dividends in the end in terms of a teaching moment. When Finn came through the door at the end of the day, he was greeted by the smell of cookies baking. If I could not feed my need to feel like a good mom by delivering his homework and saving the day, I figured a batch of warm cookies might serve as a suitable alternative. All the love, none of the rescuing. As he dumped his backpack on the floor and began to unpack his lunchbox, I asked him how his day went. I raised one eyebrow and pointed to the homework still sitting on the coffee table. What did his teacher say, I asked, when he found out the homework was missing? It was okay. My teacher and I talked about how to remember my homework, and he said I could bring it tomorrow. That's it, I asked. No staying in from recess or giving up your free time? Oh, yeah, I had to do some extra math practice during reading time, but I can just read some extra time tonight. And he made me promise to write a note in my homework book to help me remember to take my homework in tomorrow. And he did just that. He wrote himself a note, and he remembered his homework the next day, and almost every day since. Facing the consequences of his failure taught him so many things that day. He learned to own up to his mistake and talk to his teacher about solutions. He was encouraged to think about how to keep from making the same mistake again and devised a system that worked for him. And, as we discovered when we sat down together after that night's homework was done, our cookies were warm, delicious, and guilt-free. Chapter 4. Encouragement from the Sidelines. The Real Connection Between Praise and Self-Esteem. One day, while picking raspberries with my friend Elena, we started talking about her daughter, Olivia. A year before, Olivia had suffered a severe head injury and lost her memory. At first, everyone thought it would return, but her life before the accident, her family, pets, friends, school, never came back. After about a month of waiting for her to remember the previous 16 years of her life, Elena and her husband realized it was time to move on and make do with what Olivia had left. She was, and is, an otherwise capable and intelligent individual, albeit one without a past. I asked Elena how her parenting had changed over the past year, and reaching past me for a berry, she remarked, I've totally changed the way I praise my kids. I used to just tell them how smart they were, how talented and amazing, but once Olivia lost her memory, praising her just for being smart and talented didn't feel right. She was working so hard to improve and to figure out who she was and who she was going to be that it made more sense to praise her for her effort, for sticking with this crappy, horrible deal she'd gotten. The kind of praise I was giving Olivia became the kind of praise I gave all my kids, and it changed them, especially the younger ones. I can see a real difference in the way they think about themselves and their potential. Americans are huge fans of praising kids at every turn. But as I dug into the research on praise and motivation, I found that praise is a slippery and tricky parenting tool, one that could lift a kid up or tear him down, depending on how it's used. It can be the best parenting and teaching tool in your toolkit, the kind of encouragement and support that makes kids want to risk failure and reach for greater challenges, or it can destroy self-esteem. Most recent studies have shown that the worst of the destruction happens in the hearts of kids who already suffer from low self-regard, the very kids we most want to help. All praise is not equal. You are a smart kid is very different from you worked so hard on that French homework, it must have felt really good to have done well on that assignment. The first statement makes a judgment, and even if it feels like a positive and loving judgment, it has a negative effect on performance. You are smart, judges and labels the person, not the product. If I tell my son he's smart, I'm telling him that I value him for being smart, and he's going to be a lot less likely to try things that might damage his smart label, lest he fail, which, in his kid brain, could cause me to withdraw my love and approval. However, If I tell him that I am proud of him for the effort he put into editing the short story he wrote last week, I am reinforcing behavior, not judging him. 
Kids who are praised for effort are more likely to have a growth mindset, the understanding that intelligence and capability can be improved with effort. In her book, Parenting Without Borders, Surprising Lessons Parents Around the World Can Teach Us, Christine Gross Lowe writes that Americans are more prone to a fixed mindset and are drawn to terms such as talented, gifted, and prodigy, and therefore more apt to praise for these inherent qualities. Americans are much more interested in the story of a child who can pick out a Bach concerto on a keyboard at the age of five than a violinist who has put in 10,000 hours of practice in order to rise to first seat in the orchestra. While our view of intelligence tends to be one of a fixed potential, other cultures, such as Korea and Japan, view potential as a package deal made up of innate traits and deliberate effort. Gross Lowe reports. In Japan, there is less labeling. In school, students aren't separated according to ability. There is no gifted education, and most learning disabled children are integrated into the regular classroom. Instead of dividing kids up, there is a pervasive belief, reinforced in school, that it's less about what you're born with than what you do. Up to a certain point, everyone is capable of cultivating skills, even in art or music. So while in America, art and music are looked at as things for all kids to dabble in, but serious training or cultivation is reserved for kids who show talent, in East Asia there is a common belief that anyone can and should be able to achieve a certain degree of mastery in a variety of areas, whether it be mathematics, art, music, or physical education. It just takes effort. The research on the harm we can do when we create fixed mindsets is best summed up in one of Carol Dweck's experiments. Dweck and her associates gave several hundred adolescent students 10 test questions. After the test, half of the students were praised with, Wow, you got, say, eight right. That's a really good score. You must be smart at this. The other half heard, Wow, you got, say, eight right. That is a really good score. You must have worked really hard. This is the end of the disc. The audiobook continues on the next disc.